This meeting of the Council Bluff School Board will come to order. Mr. Wilson, will you call the roll? Mr. Arthur? Present. Mr. LaFerla? Present. Mr. Kazire? Present. Dr. Augress? Present. Mr. Hansen? Present. Mr. Grove? Present. Will you please stand with me for a moment of silence, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Now we're ready for introductions. Dr. Bruckner. We have a few introductions, you can tell. We are extremely honored tonight to have two groups of young people here to be honored. And um, I am purposefully going to start with the Abraham Lincoln High School boys basketball team because they have a conflicting um, schedule. They're also supposed to be at their um, celebration banquet tonight. So we have invited the Abraham Lincoln High School basketball team and coaches here tonight to recognize them all for an outstanding season. The hard work of all these young men brought them to the state tournament for the first time in many years. It's wonderful to see family members here who have supported and encouraged their sons along the way. We would like to present each of the team members and coaches with our Student Star Award, the highest award presented to students by the district and by the Board of Education. The award is sponsored by our Council Bluffs Community Education Foundation. So I would like to invite Head Coach Isaacson and Activities Director Jeff, Jeff Novotny, who says no, to the podium to give us the highlights of the season and then to introduce the star team members so that we may present them their stars. All right, first off, uh, we're, we're just very um, honored to be here and thankful for this award. Uh, these kids right here, I mean, they're absolutely everything um, about this award. You know, they'll be great representatives of it. They, they actually worked their tails off uh, to accomplish these goals. They were unselfish. They made sacrifices. They did all those things that, that you preach to kids on a daily basis, <laughs> and they embraced that and did that. Um, it was a very difficult process for them, you know, and they, for all that they did, and it's kind of nice to be awarded this way, uh, I and mean, obviously with the sex success that they had on the court. So uh, we're very thankful, and then we will um, – Get into the Star Awards. Okay. All right. First one is Adam Barrett. <laughs> Tony Bonner. <laughs> Kyle Crowell. <laughs> Spencer Decker. Trevante Jones, Josh Krabby, Devin Logan, Tyler Messenger, Tyler Myers, Justin Nealon. Ross Nickerson, Trey Nixon, Caleb Sneed, Landon Tornaden, and Reed Willison. Coaches are all back at the ranch. Yep, ranch. they're they're getting the banquet set up for okay. us. So. <laughs> so, we've got some of our managers here. Um, 
Kevin Lynn and Martavian Moss down there. So I want to thank them too. Well, on behalf of the Board of Education and the Council Bluffs Community School District, we congratulate you. Great job. We're very proud of you, very pleased that you had the success that you had. And we wish you much more success in years to come, whether you're still in the Council Bluffs Schools or you're going on to other adventures. Congratulations. I don't like how you think it. I don't like how you think it. All right, make sure you can see this lens, and I'll know I can see you. Where were you at the board meeting? I've been reporting this for a while. He's on the bus, but not as he'll get in trouble. Yep. But for a quarter, God. Awesome. That's incredible. All right, so we're going to go to I was trying to hide. Honey. Wish him well. <laughs> Nobody there for you. Okay. Dr. Brecker, is that it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I had a whole campaign of I'm not in a hot stall. Having someone who has, if Mark actually looks around, having someone who actually saying, here's the issue, here's what we need to do. If someone with a plan <laughs> might have a decent shot of beating it. My. You gentlemen were really fun to watch this season as basketball, but even more impressive, you were gentlemen every time I saw you play. And that's a big plus in my book. So congratulations, Coach, for welding these young men into that kind of character. Equally important tonight, we are proud of our schools, and we want to introduce to you the Special Olympics Iowa medalist winner cool. from March 2016. And we think it's wonderful if our AL state basketball team stays with us. We've invited our Special Olympics basketball state medalists here tonight. We're very proud of their accomplishments and you have represented our school district and your individual schools very well. I'd like to extend a special welcome and thank you to all the parents who are also here tonight. We would like to present each of the Special Olympic basketball skills state medalists with our Student Star Award, the highest award presented to students by the district and the Board of Education. Before we do that, I would like to introduce our school district Special Olympics coordinator, Nicole Vetter, and invite her to share a few words about the program, uh, if she uh, would uh, like. Two weeks ago, we had our state Special Olympic competition in Iowa City, so it was a pretty long trek for these parents to get these nine students there. But they did it, and we had a great morning. Um, we had nine medalists. We had five state champions. And if I could get, we'll just go right down the list. This is right there, and you can come I got it there. right here, oh. Martha. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, Craig, you want to afterwards and give us the. <laughs> Dinner, oh, dinner to get to. <laughs> From TJ, we had Craig Salt. He was a state champion. Come on up, Craig. <laughs> and then from Wilson, we had a whole tribe from Wilson. We had Ryan Haddon. <laughs> we had Joe Cooley from Wilson. Mason Price from Wilson. Tyler Miller from Wilson. I'm Unique Harrison from Wilson. And Jasmine Wright from Wilson. <laughs> From Roosevelt, we had Alejandra Torres. And from Rue, we had, no, Roosevelt, 
Jalen Sigmund Johnson. <laughs> That's nine. I got him. Nicely done. Great. Can you scooch in a little closer? <laughs> so to all of our Star Awards and their families and all of their supporters, have a wonderful evening. Thank you. She had one of those, you know, those mirror deals that look stroke. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, a, there's a line there that you can see. She was going the line. <laughs> what happened? What happened? Holy! See, I don't think that. Crap. I don't take the putter straight back and straight to it. Like um, I, I come just a little inside, just a just a little. Damn, I just take it by every line. I do. <laughs> That's all I know. That'd be hard. But I don't even really look. I, a lot of times I don't. It's look always fun to have student recognition. Thank I you, look Dr. Brecker. I'll look just in front of the ball. Do we have a motion to approve our agenda for tonight? I move that we approve our agenda as presented. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion carried. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of March 8th, 2016? I move um, that the minutes of March 8th, 2016 meeting be approved as presented. Is there a second? Second. Seconded. Any further discussion and questions on the minutes? All those in favor then say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion carried. Now we're to that part of our meeting where members of the public can address the board. Yes, the public is left except for one or two, huh? Okay, we'll go on then to our superintendent's report on student achievement. Thank you, President Grove. Um, tonight we're going to talk about some changes to our annual curriculum development process and Dr. Vorthman is here to share those. Did you catch this for me?
I don't know what you did, but you were magic. Thank you. Okay. Well, good evening. Good evening. Sorry for the delay. Um, it's my pleasure tonight to bring you some exciting information about uh, the way that we address curriculum adoption in the Council Bluffs Community School District. Uh, I included a little bit more comprehensive information in your board packet, but I wanted to highlight uh, several key uh, pieces of the curriculum adoption cycle, the way we've done things traditionally, and the way that we are uh, challenging ourselves to look at that process a little bit differently in light of several um, factors that I pointed out in your board packet. Uh, the first thing I want to mention tonight is that um, we're really in what I would call Generation 2.0, or our second major uh, way of looking at curriculum revision. If you uh, remember, in previous years, we've given you a report about uh, how curriculum adoption looked in various phases, uh, from phase one, when we're studying and doing data analysis, all the way up to phase five, where we're in regular program evaluation mode. Curriculum Development 2.0 is our way to respond to feedback that we've received uh, from teachers and teacher leaders, from the changing context of the educational landscape, especially as it relates to standards, um, and additionally, uh, resources that are becoming more and more scarce um, as time goes forward. So the plan I'm gonna outline tonight has a big thumbs up from several key uh, groups that we've vetted this uh, and received feedback before we brought it to the board. Uh, it's been endorsed by our curriculum specialists, who, as you recall, are part of the teacher leadership and compensation group who are tasked primarily with leading and engaging other educators uh, in curriculum revision. And we have those in all of the major content areas, areas in grades pre-K through 12. We've also uh, received feedback from our leaders, our leadership team of principals, uh, elementary and secondary, as well as our, uh, our departmental advisory teams that we have that represent a wide cross-section of all buildings and grade levels uh, in pre-K through 12. So there are three main points I want to bring to you tonight about how we are looking at um, curriculum adoption 2.0 and the things that make it unique from the way that we've developed curriculum in the past. And there are three specific outcomes that we hope to achieve as a result of using teacher feedback as a way to generate additional um, curriculum development opportunities. The first of one is to improve flexibility and responsiveness. We also hope to leverage teacher leadership in a more powerful way. And lastly, we hope to maximize the limited funding that we are receiving from the state. When we talk about improving flexibility and responsiveness, if you look at our current curriculum adoption cycle, we basically look at curriculum every eight years. Um, and that's the time that it takes for us to actually choose a, a, some standards, vet them, implement a curriculum, adopt resources, and then go through evaluation. And while in many cases that is a very sufficient way of looking at curriculum revision, we are in a much different situation than we have been in the past. And that is we have fairly static standards. In the past, states either didn't have standards or standards were developed locally, or local school districts used a smattering of state standards, local standards, national standards. But the Iowa core has changed that for us. No longer do we have to start from scratch every time we do curriculum adoption. The other thing that we can do is to improve responsibility, responsiveness and flexibility is to do what we are considering micro-targeting, and that is pushing in supplemental resources where we have good teacher feedback and data analysis indicates that we need additional supplements in the classroom. So take, for example, a teacher, a uh, group of teachers are teaching a fourth grade unit in language arts, and it's in the genre of mystery. Let's assume that they've taught that unit and they are short on classroom sets of mystery textbooks. And their data comes back and says, students really don't know how to compare multiple points of view in a mystery. Maybe one between the narrator and one of the characters. We can then go back and take that um, feedback immediately and push into that fourth grade unit additional resources that would help th those teachers be able to respond to that the next time they teach it. In our current curriculum revision cycle, depending on where they were in adoption, they would have to wait up to seven more years before we would allocate or have the ability to allocate funds um, to provide additional resources. 
Second thing we hope to do is leverage teacher leadership in a more powerful, even more powerful way. What we hope to do is to use ongoing targeted revisions by using our teacher leaders uh, to give us regular feedback on how things are going. And then take the very best that our teachers are already using and share those across the district. Uh, we have some very highly skilled and talented teachers in our district. And one of the things that we continually receive feedback is we do not have a way to harness the power of teacher collaboratively generated resources in a central repository. So if a teacher at Edison has identified a really great way to teach theme, it may be happenstance that that's shared with their third grade colleague at Bloomer or Longfellow. So what we want to do is be able to use those teacher generated resources that are of high quality and provide an opportunity for teachers to use those across the district. We also want to have an opportunity to put teachers at the table on an ongoing basis to give us feedback on how well the curriculum is meeting both their needs as a teacher in terms of resources and how well that curriculum is meeting the individual needs of students in terms of achievement. And we believe that we can do that because we now have teacher leadership in such a way that we can facilitate those conversations at several points during the year instead of waiting until one summer every seven years. And the third thing that we would like to try to do with this Generation 2.0 is to maximize our limited funding. As you well know, we are continuing to suffer from suffocation from the state legislature, um, not being able to meet uh, our, our growth um, that we need in state funding to meet our, keep the lights on and keep curriculum revision going on in the way that we've done it in the past. But what we hope to do is leverage our one-to-one -one initiative in a more meaningful way by creating a repository of high quality, aligned, and vetted open educational resources. And essentially what open educational resources are is they are a collection of freely available uh, items on, available on the internet that anyone can, can use um, that we could use to supplement our existing curricular resources. Now think about it like this. Each year, the U.S. Department of Education <coughs> grants hundreds of millions of dollars to third-party organizations to develop innovative programs and resources that, for teachers out of those programs. In the past, many of those programs have been proprietary, i.e., a company would come in and get a grant, they would produce something for a group of teachers, and then they may profit from selling that down the road. The U.S. Department of Education has put a stop to that and now mandates that all products produced with the United States Department of Education grant have to be freely available through open educational resources. The U.S. Department of Education has also launched a new program called Go Open, and it challenges schools and school districts to think about how they are using openly available, high-quality resources to supplement their existing curriculum. There are currently a handful of launch states that have been identified by the Department of uh, Education. Iowa is not one of them. Uh, but we are trying to learn from some of our states, uh, neighboring states, Missouri to the south is one of them, and figure out how they're harnessing that uh, technology to be able to provide rich resources to schools and to students. There are a few points of caution that I do want to bring to your attention. The first is, this does not eliminate the need for us to invest in educational resources. Um, but what it does do is it starts to cut our addiction to the textbook vendor as our sole source of expertise when it comes to educational content. Believe it or not, whether a textbook publisher produces some type of resource in print or in digital, the cost is the same. The textbook publishers and vendors have figured out a way to make money regardless of how much it costs them to produce the product. So just because we have a digital version of a biology textbook, it costs exactly the same as the textbook that uh, is traditionally in a classroom. We also want to, want to remind you that not all content areas have gone through a complete revision cycle. That means that some content areas have to start from scratch. Take, for example, our science curriculum. 
the state just adopted the new Iowa core science standards, which will require us to do a major revision, start from scratch, use the new standards, and put a curriculum together as a result of that. We also assume that the Iowa core will remain in place. When we, if we should ever get new standards, we would have to do a major overhaul. But we believe that we are in a good spot where we're not going to be uh, subject to new standards uh, every few years. Um, we also recognize that newly, if we do have newly adopted state standards, which will be coming in social studies in the next year or two, that they will require us to use a traditional process where we look at the body of, of standards, identify how they fit in our scope and sequence, and then align uh, resources to them. And the last thing is textbooks aren't going away. We will still use print resources and they will continue to be deployed. Uh, but what will likely happen is we will see less and less traditional textbooks that are in every single classroom across the school district. What we will see is a shift uh, towards using the one-to-one -one initiative to deploy much more of our digital content. So in conclusion, we're hoping to achieve three major uh, victories with this new curriculum development process. We're hoping to be more responsive to the needs of our teachers and student achievement with more timely micro-targeting of uh, resources, hoping to leverage our teacher leaders uh, to empower them to give us constant feedback on how we can better <coughs> serve them uh, and the curriculum that they help develop. And then lastly, we're hoping to be a better steward of resources and uh, use more, a more sustainable approach to investing in instructional resources. I would be happy to take any of your questions. Questions for Dr. Um, Vorthman. Will this new method of curriculum creation help lower the costs of our updating the curriculum to help save the district money? Yes, it actually will. What we're anticipating is uh, in, in any given year, depending on what curriculum is up for adoption, we spend somewhere between $700,000 and $1.2 million to do a complete overhaul. Now that depends on what the content area is and who's affected. So for example, if we were to do a traditional language arts adoption in grades K through 12, that's about, that would affect about 9,000 students. We would expect to spend about $1.2 million for an adoption. That would be pretty typical. What we believe that we can do with this system is set aside a pot of money that we will use to flexibly push and deploy resources when they are needed, instead of saying, it's not your turn, you have to wait. So we can be much more responsive to the needs of teachers and to the student achievement. We will have to invest in some type of repository to house vetted, aligned, and high quality curriculum resources. Um, we know that they are out there. We've talked to several vendors who um, specialize in this product, so there will be some upfront investment in that. But we're projecting that we may set aside about 25% of what we traditionally spend um, and see how that goes, to see if we're able to adequately meet the needs of uh, what our student achievement data tells us and what teacher feedback tells us. And would you still continue to do a revision of sorts or once the set core standard is set, you would just push and pull as needed or? Yeah, what we, what we anticipate doing is uh, continuing to, the standards don't change, but what changes is the way that we present the standards, mm -hmm. the order in which we do it, which ones take priority, and what resources go in to support that. That's really what makes a curriculum. The standards themselves are just a set of expectations for students. What makes a curriculum is the way in which we push it out to kids and deliver it to them. So what we anticipate will likely happen is instead of us doing that process once every on the eighth year, what will happen is we will do a tweak and an adjustment along the way every year, maybe even every trimester, um, so that we're having that constant communication loop with our teachers and teacher leaders so that when we get back to that unit the next time we teach it, we don't forget what we needed to change. And that's, that, that's one of the downfalls of doing it uh, on such an elongated timeline, is sometimes you lose the immediacy of being able to respond just in time. 
Okay, but you're not anticipating any of those core standards changing. We're that was one of my assumptions. That's, we're that's assuming, the assumption that we're assuming everything that stays we're not going to have any major standard <laughs> changes. Uh, we know that so we're we know that we're going to have social studies in a year, and probably a year from now. There's a task force right now that's considering those changes. We know that we will have that, um, but outside that, we don't anticipate major changes to the core uh, standards. You mentioned science. I assume you're going to work with that area this year, coming year. Yeah, actually, we were uh, we were ahead. Um, our science teachers pushed us pretty hard. They wanted to be part of the new standards as well. So when the national next generation science standards came out two and a half years ago, we jumped on the those standards and we localized them. And so we were a little bit ahead of the state, which is sometimes a good thing and sometimes not a good thing. Um, so what we had to do is we had to do a little bit of adjustment in our middle school curriculum, which we'll be working on this summer. Um, the standards are set up right now uh, through the next generation science standards as grade band standards. And the state of Iowa decided to put them in grade levels. So we have to go back and move some things around. Um, and supplement some resources to do that. And we are currently in our pilot year for K-5. So we will be doing a resource adoption this summer to support that initiative. So this will be the first area where we can see if we save less than 1.2 million bucks. Well, we are committed to K-6 science to spend about $600,000 this year. Okay. It will be, social studies will be our first true test. I see. Okay. They've worked on all the curriculum. They've got, if you recall, we were supposed to do that adoption last year, but the funding was pulled out from under us at the last minute by the governor last year, and we shelved that adoption because we couldn't afford it. Another question about the, I think it was the level, leverage teacher leadership. Yeah. Okay. Um, when you're talking about an elementary teacher in the third grade finds a really good program and wants to share. Um, does that tie in with professional development at any level, or is that something? It would depend on how big of a change it, it was. Okay. Um, the nice thing about our teacher leadership and compensation program is that we have really highly skilled teachers that are in those leadership roles that are able to vet some of those uh, different types of resources. Um, and then they can collaborate when we do revisions. They can bring those resources to the table and determine as a team if this is something that we really think that we should invest in. You know, one of the things we don't want to do is stifle innovation, but at the same time, we want to manage consistency across the district. So that's a tight balance between those two things, try to achieve those two things. We want to use teacher leaders to help us manage um, those types of decisions along the way. Okay. Are there other districts using this approach, or are we being innovators here? I would say we're probably somewhat innovative within our state. This is not a new approach nationally. Um, some are way ahead of us. Okay. Other questions? Sounds Thank good you. to me. Go for it. Thank you. Informational presentations. We have an enrollment report. Mr. McGreevy is here to share. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Can I make this short and sweet for you guys? Um, all this information is in your board packet. This is just a quick summary for you all. I'm John McGreevy. I'm the Student Information Systems Analyst for the district. Enrollment so far this trimester has increased 80 year kids since last trimester two, uh, which is good news. There's been an increase of 89 students since official enrollment on October 1st. Minority population <laughs> remains steady around 21.53%. Uh, we have very, very little from that. Our mobility rate right now is at 7.34%, which is a decrease from last year. Um, I redid the calculation, so it's more accurate now. I know it was off during first trimester. Um, ELL remains steady at 563 students. Special education increased um, since last year. Again, across the board, we're increasing numbers. Um, 
I've just looked at trimester three numbers. We are up another 24 students so far in trimester three also. Gosh, if only we had money for those schools. I agree. <clears throat> Next year. We keep the spending authority. After looking through your board practice, do you have any questions about the trimester two enrollment? I have a question on the uh, PK3. Okay. Um, so are those, uh, are we experiencing any any other resources or how are, we how are we changing to, I guess, are there any classes that are a little overwhelmed with that? Or are those evenly spread out throughout all the elementaries? Or? They are evenly spread out throughout the elementaries. Thought it was a nice, good sign. Do we have any information about the double digit loss in the 12th grade at one of our high schools? I do not off the top of the hand, but I can do some research for you and let you know. According to your chart, it looks like a significant number of seniors that yes. lost. Well, I noticed on the other end that K1 and there's a pre-K, one of the three classes there with over 700 kids in it. That is correct. And we don't have any grade level above that with 700 kids, right? Um, kindergarten was 751, first grade was 711, uh, fourth grade was 710. So if that trend keeps going, we're, we're going to have some housing problems here pretty quick. It, it seems to be the consensus there, yes. Good problem to have, maybe. Any other questions for Mr. McGreevy? Okay, thank you. thank you. Keep that Thanks, enrollment Jen. going up. Update on financial planning for 2016 and 17 and 2017 18. I assume all the board members got the news about the legislative action today. Mm -hmm. So now we know. Isn't it great to have the press here? Both of them, all three of them. <laughs> Good work. We don't say that every time the press comes. We <laughs> like the current press members and media. Um, I am going to take a few minutes to talk about what we're recommending for tentative plans to address what we perceive is inadequate funding for schools as of today. and. Um, Going along with what we always talk about, I want to share two different images that we use in our planning. First of all, as you recall, our theme for this year is defying gravity. And defying gravity gets harder and harder the more the pull is to take away funding from schools. So we're still trying our best to be optimistic as we move forward, but we're very aware of the challenges ahead of us. And you know that we consistently talk about creating the, world, the path forward. I thought about crossing that out, saying we can't do it without state fund, but we are very optimistic that we can still do great things for the children that we work with. So that's my backdrop. I found some sort of clip art for every single page. And it's all very important. I picked it out on purpose, so just so you know that. Recommended school funding, as President Grove said, came out today. Um, the state is recommending a 2.25% increase, which is about $145 per student. The total that we will get in Council of Schools based on enrollment is $1,483,000. Just let you know, that's 1% higher than what we received last year, but it's 0.25 below what we thought we had last year until the governor vetoed that on July 3rd. So while we're very, very pleased that we know this number, we're not very pleased with what the number is. In addition to that, the board needs to be aware, and we need to be aware of the fact that the budget at this point has no funding for the summer literacy program. That was discussed at the legislative coffee last Saturday. Um, uh, the state has come up with requirements that say we must have an intensive summer school program as of next year or retain children that can't read in third grade. Um, 
and right now there is no funding for that program. Likewise, there is no funding and no final decision about what the new state assessment will be next year. We believe that our April assessment using Iowa assessments is the last time we'll be using Iowa assessments, but we do not have any funding from the state to purchase the assessment going forward, which we realize will be more expensive. So if there's no funding for those two programs and there's still a requirement to have them, then our funding issues have just increased. But let me talk about some recommendations that a lot of people in our district have been involved in making. First of all, the board knows and our staff knows that we are at this point, March 22nd, saying that there will be no involuntary loss of jobs for the 16-17 school year. Um, we believe that it's not fair at the end of March to tell people they don't have a job for next year. So we will look very, very carefully at any attrition and if there are positions out there that we feel we don't have to fill we may not fill them but we will not pink slip anyone this year likewise we're going to try for one more year to attempt to maintain class sizes similar to this year we can't promise that going forward that we will do that forever but right now we're going to try very hard to live within the funding um, goal guidelines that we've we've presented to our parents to our principals and to our board. So what shall we do? First of all, this is on purpose, the number one mm -hmm. item, because this will be the most um, obvious change that will probably occur based on our funding changes. We are going to closely study the possibility of changing school starting and ending times in order to decrease busing costs. Right now we have a two-tier system which means the bus drivers take students to secondary schools and then go back and take them to elementary schools. We think that if we make, move that to a three-tier system, we will save a considerable amount of money. Right now, we believe it's in the two hundred dollars to $300,000 range, but we are going to wait until we have final um, data from for a student to tell us. So that's a change in a tradition that's going to be interesting to live through. We had a committee that studied very carefully how do you make that work because you have to have enough time for the buses to get from one school to another school. So option one, the, the committee looked at four different options. Only two of them seem to be viable. This one, option one, which says that middle schools will start next year if this is approved at 7.30 in the morning and they will dismiss at 2.30 in the afternoon. Now let me just remind you, we have lots of wonderful after school activities for middle school students. So we're not saying that they'll all go home at 2.30. They'll all be starting their after school activities in. The time for option one to push it, pushes the high school schedule back from 7.50 to 8.10 and pushes the egg, um, ending of the day back from 2.50 to 3.10. And for elementary schools, it pushes the day back from 8.45 to 8.55 and the um, end of school from 3.35 to 3.45. That's option one. Option two, keeps the middle school folks at exactly the same option. Um, middle school representatives on the committee thought that, you know, there's an awful lot of middle school kids that are outside of those buildings at seven o'clock, some at 6.30. So we think that that's doable. Um, we presented it to middle school staff. Good news, bad news. Good news, you get out earlier. Bad news, you start earlier. At the elementary school, option two pushes the start of the school day earlier to 8.10 and lets the elementary children out of school at 3 o'clock. And the high school is pushed back starting at 8.45 and getting out of school at 3.45. There are pros and cons to each of those changes. Um, there is some research that say, says that elementary students are really ready to go earlier in the day than we give them credit for. Um, so moving the elementary schedule up to 810 may have some good benefits. The similar research says that pushing high school schedule back to 845 also has some good benefits for children. Um, however, as we are, 
always very efficient. We start thinking about what could we do with that found time. And at the high school, we've already had people talk about, well, you could have some athletic practices earlier than that at 630, <laughs> which would mean that we wouldn't really s let kids sleep later. And that we, we now have a zero hour. This would push the start of school zero hour back. But if students had practices before school, that would be complicating. So I'm here for a couple of reasons. First of all, to be very transparent with the board and with our community that we are looking very seriously at changing starting times and ending times for school for next year. We're telling you now in March so that we can do study and you can give us some feedback. Once we have feedback from the bus company that really does categorize for us that this change is worth, worth doing financially, we will have surveys with both our staff members and our parents, families, about which of these options they like. Now that's dangerous because we realize that there may not be a obvious agreement that, oh, you should do option one or you should do option two. But in order to make a decision, we think we need some feedback. If unequivocally, everybody in the, and 80 percent of the people in the district say, we like option two, we're probably going to choose option two. If 50 percent of the people say we like option one and 50 percent of the people say we like option two, then we're going to have to do some deciding. If elementary parents and teachers say we like option one and high school student teachers and parents say we like option two, then again we're going to have to do some study. But we think the possibility of saving between two hundred and three hundred thousand dollars every year is worth this kind of um, trauma for our community. Before I move on, what questions can I ask about answer about that? I received feedback today from two high school students who um, are aware of this, and they uh, wanted me to share that they are completely in favor of option one for several reasons, um, mostly after school activities, picking up younger siblings at schools. Um, and then the biggest concern was after school jobs that some of these students attend to. And if they're getting out at 345, it makes it hard for them to get to work by four o'clock. Um, but those were the two phone calls that I received today about that they prefer option one. My guess is that if you talk to a lot of people, you're going to get differing perceptions. I was at a community gathering over the weekend, and I had people from both the elementary school and the high school tell me they liked option two better. So what we're going to do, once we have some evidence that this is worth the price from the bus company, is um, do some sort of tallies probably our own employees through a survey monkey that they can take easily, and probably our parents um, and families from a phone school messenger um, system that they can just push one if they want school to start at 810, push two if they want school to start at 845. Um, we will let people know ahead of time that that phone call is coming. Um, but we think that that's going to give us the opportunity to have the most um, feedback from our community. And then we will share that with everybody that's in the deciding mode. Do you have an estimated time of when you're going to hear back from the bus company? For uh, they suggested um, second week in April. We have a tally. We, we've been told that it will save between $260,000 and $280,000. But I said to the bus company, because... Um, they've raised their rates recently. I said, I want in writing what the savings would be from these options. And to their credit, they're studying it very carefully. If it comes back and it's $50,000, um, then we'll have to decide if that's worth it. But if it's in the three, six digits, we probably need to look at it seriously. Is there any difference between the options? Is, are you anticipating a significant difference between options cost? one and two? Mm -hmm. uh, it's about, as I recall, $10,000. I think, Dean, which you, do you remember which one? One of them. Option one, option one will cost us about three more buses. 
So what we're, we're anticipating is that if you're going to save, say, uh, fif 15 buses in option two, you may, you may only save 12 in option one. So we're talking about a three bus difference roughly between the two of them. Uh, about the middle school, I guess my question is they didn't, the elementary and the high school are flipped in each option. Was there a reason the middle school stayed at 730 for both options or? Yes, the reason is, is be, based on the number of students, based on where they live, they have to have enough time to get the kids, drop them off and get to the next batch. And the way that they configured this, this was op, this was the way they could optimize it. Okay. I think we transport more middle school children further than we transport high school or elementary students. Any other questions? The before care services, kids and company, they're aware of this. They're aware. Of, potential they're aware of it. I don't have a question, but I'd just like to make a point. <clears throat> this could potentially save four or five teaching positions. Mm -hmm. And I realize I'm not a parent, so I'm not affected by these concerns that Dr. Agres has shared. But when people say we want to keep class size small, this is one way to do it. So sometimes personal inconvenience <clears throat> has to be overweighed with what's good for the whole district. I guess my only other question is are the about the after school activities those would adjust then as well that's correct I'd, I'd say at all levels but that would take some some time I know some of those calendars are out a year in advance <coughs> for some of those sports okay I'm gonna go on to some other recommended responses that we are looking at First of all, we are looking at the possibility of combining some job responsibilities for one or more school administrators and perhaps not filling an open position right now. We are looking at reducing the number of teachers serving in time release leadership positions and decreasing the release time for other teacher leadership positions. Now what that means is if we can um, we have several teacher leadership positions that are out of the classroom, half or three-fourths or full-time. If we can reduce that out of classroom time, um, we could save some money. I want to say unequivocally, we think the way we have it organized right now is the best way. But if we don't have funding to support it going forward, we think that's a, probably a more logical cut than some other cuts. For the most part, this would be a response in the 17-18 school year, but if we can do it by attrition for next year, we would try to do that. We are going to eliminate a current opening, 0.5, in the Elementary Talented and Gifted program. Um, this position has been opened all year. Um, we did not find a suitable replacement for this year. Um, we're going to quit looking for a suitable replacement and make it work the way we've made it work this year. We are going to reduce, we're estimating, 12 to 15 or so paraeducation positions. This will be through attrition rather than any reduction in force. But if a paraeducator is resigning or retiring um, and we can find ways to not fill that position, we will not fill the position. We are going to eliminate a supplemental services contract with a community agency that is serving students with disabilities currently. We're not naming that because we haven't had the conversation with the agency yet, except to tell them that we're thinking about it. We are going to shift clerical assignments for busing coordination within the school district, which we think is going to result in a decreased position through attrition. We are going to move appropriate contracts, everything we possibly can find to move out of general fund to PEPL in order to sustain spending authority. We're well aware of the fact that the more of these things we put into PEPL, such as ongoing non-instructional contracts, um, leases for, for various decisions we make, um, it takes away from our ability to use the PEPL funds for 
sustaining facilities. But we think we can do it. We're going to try. And we're going to seek energy efficiencies, such as LED lighting, on an ongoing basis. We cannot do the whole school district right now because there's a significant upfront cost, even though there's a rebate associated with it. But as quickly as we can, we're going to move towards finding energy efficiencies. We know already we're going to renew our copy service contract to provide a reduction in cost. We're estimating about $40,000. We are going to capture savings. Uh, you gave us permission to offer an early retirement program. Um, we are looking at net turnover savings if we hire um, people at lower salary than exiting people. With those, cap those savings will help us. We are going to bring to you in a future board meeting a perpetual lease for a Kern property, on Kern property for a cell tower which if we acknowledge right now that we will let this company have it over a five-year period, we save about $50,000 over what we would have saved if we just leased it over 20 years. We're looking <coughs> everywhere, you can tell. And thanks to good thinking on the part of teaching and learning, and Dr. Vorthman presented earlier, we are going to examine alternate curriculum resource adoption procedures. We don't think that will have a major savings in 2016-17, but it certainly could have a major savings beyond that. So future steps. We hope in spring and or summer to arrange for district representatives to meet from, with representatives from all our employee groups to get input on what will likely be more serious reductions for the 17-18 school year. If funding does not increase again for the 17-18 school year, um, my projection is we cannot do it with the kinds of reductions we are showing you tonight. We will have to talk about um, decreasing personnel, most likely increasing class size, perhaps reducing some services to children. We can't do it. We can't find four to six million dollars by doing what we're doing next year. But we think it's much more fair to have those conversations now rather than to surprise people in March of 2017. So here's what our goal will be. My last pictures. Our goal throughout this process is not this. <laughs> but our goal is this. We cannot lose sight of our mission, which is to help children graduate ready for the next stage in their lives. So this has been a hard week. This is a hard conversation, but we cannot let it get the best of us. We have to make decisions for how we can continue to do the amazing work that's happened in the last nine years. You know, we know, our graduation rate has increased nine years in a row. We still don't have any official tally on the graduation rate for the class of 2015, but if budget cuts start pushing that number down, we will have warned everybody we know that we can't keep doing this if we don't have the kind of support that we need. So we thought it was very important to let board members know and to let our staff members to know and to speak about it in public to say, um, we're glad to know what the funding is for next year. We're not convinced that we can do everything we need to do with the amount of funding we're given. Are there any questions I could answer? Do you have a prediction, Mr. Wilson, on next year's budget, how much will be overspent with this state funding figure? I know we haven't settled with our employee groups and all that yet, but uh, so there's some there's, there's some fluidity in there right now that we're trying to nail down. Right now, we're, it's about two million bucks is what I'm projecting. And this year, we're going to be how much? About uh, two and a half million. Three and a half. Two and a half. Two and a half. So you're estimating we're improving our position by a half a million bucks. Yes, and the only reason that we're, that we're improving our position about a half a million bucks is because our enrollment's up, 
and we're getting a little extra funding for that. And because our enrollment up is in special ed, we get a little extra waiting for that. Okay? So that's what's so fluid is that if, if I knew what enrollment was going to be, we could come to a better number. Sure. But I'm just, you know, it's basically saying it's going to stay flat. We know that's not going to happen. If, we, if it goes up, we're obviously going to be a little bit better off. But If those 89 students that came since October 1st would have been here on October 1st, we would be in a much better position right now. Thank you. Any other questions Just for Dr. Another question. A potential idea to dissolve an agreement with a facility that provides services to disabled students, would that make them think twice about where they're receiving their services from our district or moving to a different district? What type of services are we talking about for disabled children? I'm trying to be sure I follow the question before I answer the wrong question. On one of your slides, you talked about right. potentially dissolving an agreement. Right. Thank you. Now I understand. Um, that agreement, we believe, is something that we can provide, provide in-house in okay. at a lower cost. Okay. We'd rather not if druthers were known, but we think we can. We have to, serve, as you all know, we have to serve the needs of special education students, and we will continue to do that. Um, this will make us do a little bit of rearranging, but we think we can do that. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Should I leave this up for the rest of the night? I will. Any yeah. other questions? Any other questions for Dr. Bruckner on potential budget adjustments? Very helpful. Thank you. Okay, I guess we're ready for our resolutions. The first one is approval of the resolution and set date for public hearing on the 2016-17 budget. Is there a motion? Yeah, I can uh, make a motion to authorize and direct the secretary to give notice of a public hearing to consider and approve the 2016-2017 budget to be held at the ESC offices 300 West Broadway Suite 1600, Council of Iowa, at 6.30 p.m. on April 12th, 2016. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Are there any board members that wish to discuss that? Pretty routine, I think. Go ahead and call the roll, Mr. Wilson. Mr. Arthur? Yes. Mr. Hansen? Yes. Mr. LaFerla? Yes. Mr. Kazire? Yes. Dr. Augress? Yes. Ms. Riley? Yes. Mr. Grove? Yes. And the motion carries. Next up is a purchase agreement related to the athletic com complex. Is there a motion? I move to authorize the board president to sign the purchase agreements for purchase of the following property. A tract of land being the property known as Lot 253 in Belmont in addition to Council Bluffs, Pottawatomie County, Iowa. Is there a second? Second. Second, second it. Any further discussion? Questions about this purchase? Mr. Hansen? I have a question. Is this the property where we were having issues getting the final signature from the property owner? No, this isn't that property. This is the property that was originally foreclosed. Okay. So we still have one property left? We still have three properties left. One um, house. We have a verbal agreement. We have a verbal um, date set for uh, the person vacating the premises, but we do not have the paper signed. And then we are still um, working with the two <laughs> businesses who will not be displaced, but who will be affected by the entrance to their businesses. Thank you. Any other questions about the motion? Please call the roll, Mr. Wilson. Dr. Augress? Yes. Ms. Riley? Yes. Mr. Arthur? Yes. Mr. LaFerla? Yes. Mr. Kazire? Yes. Mr. Hansen? Yes. Mr. Grove? Yes. And the motion carries. Next, we have the final reading of the following policies and corresponding administrative regulations, 401, general personnel policies, 401.2, staff vacancies, 401.3, negotiations, legal status, 401.4, workplace safety, 412, personnel complaints, grievances, and termination process, 413, appraisal of licensed personnel, 421, suspension of personnel, 
429, classified employee wage and compensation. 425, appropriate use of computers, computer network, and the internet employees. Is there a motion to approve those final policies? I'll make a motion to approve the policies and corresponding administrative regulations as presented. Is there a second? Second. Second. Thank you. Any further discussion? I have a question with code 401.2. We have the change adding the words in accordance with law, but when I notice at the bottom, we don't have a cross-reference to any of the Iowa codes or any specific laws. Is there a reason we don't have a specific law referenced at the bottom of this policy? My guess is that's an oversight and we will add it. We'll ask our attorney to add it. Is that okay with the rest of the board? That speaks to your concern, Mr. Hansen? Oh, yes. I was yeah. just wondering if there was a reason. Sure. Perhaps we simply said in accordance with law to verify if a law got passed or perhaps, in, you know, maybe there wasn't a specific law regarding it at this point, but we wanted to be sure that sure. in the event a law was passed or if there is a law that we get it recorded. Thank you. Any other comments, questions about those policies? Yes, staff vacancies. Will you call the roll, Mr. Wilson? Mr. Arthur? Yes. Mr. LaFerla? Yes. Mr. Kazire? Yes. Dr. Augress? Yes. Ms. Riley? Yes. Mr. Hansen? Yes. Mr. Grove? Yes. And the motion carries. Now we have the final reading of policy 432, employee use of social media electronic messaging. Is there a motion? Yeah, I'll move to approve the second and final reading of policy 432 employee use of social media, electronic messaging. Second. There's a second from Dr. Algress. Any further discussion? I, I really want anyone that's watching to realize that we appreciate comments from the board members and we take them very, very seriously. So there was a lot of work done on this policy um, between the last board meeting and this board meeting to make it uh, more acceptable to the board. So we listened and uh, feel that we met the concerns that were expressed. Any other comments, questions? Um, I guess I just hope that if people have questions about this, they will actually look, go to the board packet, and you can see what's actually out there. And there's been a lot of work on it to make it where we are not infringing on the rights of our staff, um, but are protecting our students our other employees in the community and, and the district as a whole. Um, and it's, I think, very fair. And I, I would note also that we're not the only district dealing with this. <laughs> uh, and if you saw the IASB thing about their April 13th policy meeting, that's one of the topics is social media. So uh, maybe again, we're just a little bit at the forefront of this, but. I feel comfortable with what we've done, and uh, as I said at the last meeting, this is a good example of why we have two readings of a policy. I have a question. Is there a reading, reason why some of portions of the policy are underlined in the packet? Underlined means that's a, a word that's added since the last time you saw the policy. And crossed out means we took out the word that you last saw. This is a new policy, so it's a combination of some other policies, so we're trying to let board members and anyone else that sees it know exactly what changes we made to it. So an underline in this revision of the policy, the actual policy itself will not have underlines. I Correct. Correct. Thank you for that clarification, Mr. Hansen. Any other questions, comments before we vote? Please call the roll, Mr. Wilson. Mr. Arthur? Yes. Ms. Dr. Augress? Yes. Mr. LaFerla? Yes. Mr. Kazire? Yes. Ms. Riley? Yes. Mr. Hansen? Yes. Mr. Grove? Yes. And the motion carries. Our last item is the approval of the consent agenda. At this meeting, it's just personnel action and claims and accounts. Is there a motion? I move that the consent agenda items be approved as presented. Is there a second? second? Thank you, Mr. Arthur. Any questions, comments about any of that? Okay, those, please call the roll, Mr. Wilson. Dr. Augress? Yes. Mr. Arthur? Yes. Mr. LaFerla? Yes. Mr. Kazire? Yes. 
Ms. Riley? Yes. Mr. Hansen? Yes. Mr. Grove? Yes. And the motion carries. And that concludes our meeting for tonight. Meeting adjourned.